Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to another video lecture. I have to admit, you'll see some of the notes are already written down, and that's because, again, I went through most of this lecture, made a mistake somewhere along the way, and then decided to throw it all out and start again. So you are seeing take two, at least for the first half of this. Um, <clears throat> so today we're going to talk a little bit more about the third step of our statistical process, analyze the data. And we've actually already seen two ways that we can analyze data. One was the scatter plot, which is a way to analyze two numeric variables. Um, remember the x and the y axis and points on the graph corresponding to the different observations in the data set. And then we also had a way to visualize two categorical variables with a contingency table. Um, now, note in each of these cases, these visualizations gave us an idea of the relationship between two variables. Um, today, we're actually going to be talking about how to just visualize a single variable. So if all you have um, is one piece of information about a group of um, subjects, observations, people, um, how can we visualize that data and what sort of meaningful questions can we ask about it? So as a motivating example, we have the IQ test scores of 60 randomly chosen fifth grade students. So they had a simple random sample, hopefully of every single fifth grade student, they gave them an IQ test and they recorded their IQ scores in this table right here. And you'll note every single number corresponds to a different student who took the test. <clears throat> so there are a number of questions we can ask about data that look like this. We can ask how spread out are they? What is their range? You know, like their max minus their min. Are there like a few high scores and mostly low scores? Or are there are mostly high scores with a few really, really low scores, right? There are a bunch of different ways that these numbers could be spread out. And our goal is to answer these questions and to create a visualization that we can read in such a way that we can immediately see the answer to these questions. Oh, another notion that we might want to think about is what is the center? So, <laughs> and I say that in quotations here because there are a number of ways we can think about center and we're going to talk about that more in the upcoming two lectures. So more to come. Um, what I'm going to teach us to do is with this numeric data, we're going to make a histogram. And there are four steps in doing so. And the first step, is to bin the data. So you can already see here, I have posted a photo of a classic binning exercise. And basically what you do when you bin the data is you decide upon, I'll write that out myself, you decide upon a bin width, which is actually pretty subjective. And we'll talk about the choice of bin width in a bit. Um, but basically, you think of the width of each of the bins that you're going to decide, decide upon, and you want to think about how wide you want them to be. In this case, we have, um, in this case, our bin width is equal to 10. Note it goes, for example, 80, 89, but we're including the endpoints. So 80 and 89 are included. So there's actually 10 numbers in that bin and not nine. And basically what you do is you decide upon your bins and you count up how many of these numbers up here are in each of your bins. So if we went through all 60 of these ICQ scores, we would discover that there are three of them that fall into the range of 80 to 89, four between 90 and 99, and so on and so forth. Once you have binned the data, you want to draw them. And I've gone ahead and done that for us here. You'll note that the frequency is on the y-axis and our different bins are lined up in the order that they are supposed to be on the x-axis. The height of each of these bars corresponds to how many observations we saw in that bin. So if I were to do this again for these two, I would say how many bins were between 80 and 89. If we look back up at our table, there were three between 80 and 89, four between 90 and 99. So between 80 and 89, I would go up to three. Between 90 and 99, I would go up to four. And that's how I've written all of these bins on this histogram. And <clears throat> This is a very good way to see how many observations lie in each kind of segment of our sample space that we have, that we've created by our bin width. 
maybe maybe that wasn't the best way to explain it. We've created all these bins and we know that all of our data belongs in at least one of these bins. And here's how many belong in each bin. That's probably a more intuitive way of saying that sentence. So once you have drawn your bins and made your histogram, you really want to take a step back and just look at it. This is a visualization that can actually answer all of the questions that we had before. How do they range? Well, it seems that they range between somewhere around 149 on the high end and somewhere around 80 on the low end. So we have an idea of the range here. <clears throat> What's the spread like? We don't have really, really high scores and really, really low scores. We have um, a reasonable range and it looks like most of the mass is in the middle here at 110 to 119. We can read off that the highest bin is 110 to 119. And we can also note that this is approximately symmetric. And what I mean by that is if I were to draw a line down the center, I could fold the graph in half and it would approximately line up. It's not gonna be exact, but when you see data like this, this is about as symmetric as you're ever really gonna get. So I would definitely call this data symmetric. <clears throat> so that was the third step. Just take a look at it, right? Because that's the reason we wanna draw these visualizations is because we can look at it immediately and start making building an understanding of how the data is distributed. The fourth step, which I've written as optional, because you don't really need this step to just be able to look at your data. Although <clears throat> you don't need it to look at your data, but we are going to need it for things that we're going to be doing next in this class. So I am going to teach it to us and we are going to use this step a lot because it's sort of the stepping stone to talking about probability densities, which is really where we're headed with all of this. Um, the fourth step is to rescale your histogram. And the way that you do that is you use the following formula. I want the count in bins over total number of observations divided by bin width. So with this formula, our goal is to rescale all of the values in our counts column on this table. And don't worry, I am gonna motivate why we're doing this, but first I'm just gonna show you how to do it. So to rescale, <clears throat> you perform this calculation on every single one of these numbers. So as an example, let's do it on the first. The count in the first bin is three, so I want three. There are 60 total fifth graders that we examined for this data set, and the bin width was 10. So this is equal to 0 0.005, which I'm gonna put right here. Now, I can repeat this calculation for every single count in my table. And I'm going to do so. I'm just not going to necessarily walk us through every single one like I've done for the first one. These are the numbers that I got. I would encourage you to try this calculation yourself. If you don't get the same thing as me, maybe try it again. If you still don't get the same thing as me, come and talk to me in office hours, because who knows, maybe it's possible that I made a mistake. I do it all the time. Hence why this is the second time I have spoken this lecture. <laughs> all right, so we wanna do this calculation. We want to get these new values for our y-axis. Now what we want to do is we want to take this graph that we had and we want to rescale the y-axis. So instead of having frequency on the y-axis, nope, 
instead of having frequency on the y-axis, we're actually going to have density is what it's called. So I may have done this a little fast here, but basically the height of this bin is now um, this height right here, 0 0.05. 0 0.005, right? And you'll note it doesn't actually change our picture whatsoever, which is why I first wrote this step as optional, because it's not going to change it. It's just sort of a rescaling. The only thing that changes is the y-axis right here. But the thing that is really good about this, and the reason we want to do it, is now the area under the curve is equal to the proportion of values in that bin. Now let's think about that for a second. What is the area in bin One ten to one nineteen. Well, one ten to one nineteen. That is area is base times height, right? For a rectangle, the base, as we know, is just the bin width, which is ten. What was the height for one ten to one nineteen? We will go back to our table. It was zero point zero two eight three. which is equal to 0 0.283 or 28.3%, right? So this was the area in the bin. Let's also just think about what are the proportion of values in our whole histogram that belong in the bin 110 to 119. Well, that would be 17 values out of the 60, right? So if I, on the flip side, just look at Proportion of values in 110 to 119. Well, this is just seven, the 17 values that belong in that bin over the 60 total values, which is 0 0.283 or 28.3%. And oh my goodness, they're the same. It did exactly what I said it would do. Whenever we rescale the y-axis in this way, we can, instead of calculating the proportions like we would normally do, it now just becomes a calculation of the area of that bin, um, which is really cool. Um, <clears throat> it's suddenly, it's taken what was just a proportion calculation and made it into an, a geometry calculation. You just need to calculate the area under the bin and it'll give you the proportion of values within that bin. So, you know, something to think about. In fact, I think your upcoming homework is going to make you do something along these lines in addition to something even a little bit harder. So please come to office hours if you have any issues with it. Um, so that is histograms. We have our four steps. Don't forget them. Try to practice them. Go through this example if you have time. Um, one little comment is that, um, is that bin width really does matter. And your choice of bin width will change how you see your visualization. Or it will change how you see the data. So note this is the exact same data. These are histograms of the exact same data but they're just with different bin widths. So I think this one is eight, has a bin width of eight. This one has a bin width of five. Yeah, five. This one, it was looking like two. And this one, it's looking like a bin width of 20. 
So you'll note these are very different visualizations, and but they are of the same data. So you should be very um, careful whenever you try bin widths, and I would say whenever you're presented with a new source of data, probably try to go for something looking like one of the two of these. But you know, try a bunch of different bin widths and make sure you start building a dialogue of the data about the data on all of the different bin widths that you observe. So that is histograms. I'm actually, just to wrap up this lecture, I'm gonna leave us with a little definition that you're going to need moving forward. An outlier is an observation that lies outside. the overall pattern. Of a distribution. So this is a very common term when you talk about data an outlier something that is out of the ordinary much larger or much smaller than the rest of the data that we observed. I have a little example here. Let's see if I remember what this example says. Yes, yeah, so this is a histogram of all 50 states in the US. Um, <clears throat> and the proportion of people in those states that are 65 and older. And you'll notice that um, most of us follow sort of this almost bell curve kind of in the middle. So North Carolina and my home state, Pennsylvania, are in here. Um, and we have two outliers. Alaska has a much lower proportion of people who are 65 and older living there. And Florida has a much higher, Florida's mostly old people and Alaska's mostly young people, it would seem. Um, so yeah, this is the basic idea of outliers and moving forward, we're going to be learning about how to identify outliers and handle them. Um, and I think that wraps up everything I wanted to say for this video lecture. So I hope to see you all in our next live lecture.